Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order with a quick roll call. Regent Acker? Present. Regent Beam? Here. Regent Bernstein? Present. Regent Brown? Here. Regent Hubbard? Here. Regent Illich by Zoom? Here. Regent Weiser? Here. Regent White? Here. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for this Regent's meeting. I'd like to begin by offering our most profound sympathies to the loved ones of those who were wounded and lost on Monday night at Michigan State University. As you know, we have lowered the flags across our campuses to half staff, and in coordination with the vigil on the diag last night, we lit the Burden Tower in green and white. Several of us attended the vigil, organized by the students, and it was clear that our community has such a deep sense of compassion, as well as a terrible feeling of anguish and loss for our friends and colleagues and family members in Lansing. So we must continue to do all that we can to support one another at the University of Michigan and our colleagues and friends at Michigan State University in this hour of grief and need. Let us remember those who lost their lives with a moment of silence. The safety and wellness of our community is and always will be our highest priority as regents and the administration of this institution. We've had an extremely ambitious start to this year, and it's hard to believe that the inauguration is just three weeks away. To give a sense of the scope and scale of our achievements thus far, here are just a few which uh, we won't be covering later today. Some of you may know that we accepted, accepted an invitation to join the U7 Plus Alliance of World Universities, only the fifth U.S. institution to join the alliance, which is dedicated working together to address the most pressing global issues of our time. The University of Michigan debate program, one of the oldest in the United States, received a donation of $1 million, the largest gift in its history. And we announced a commitment of $20 million to accelerate transformative discovery and impact through the arts among our students, staff, and faculty, and across our region and community. It's also important that we acknowledge this uh, signal increase in funding for higher education that Governor Whitmer proposed last week. More than an investment in the universities of Michigan, her proposal represents an investment in the people of Michigan. An investment made in the high confidence that our students will become engaged citizens, successful workers, and outstanding leaders. At our gathering of regents in January, we had a number of thoughtful and truly insightful conversations about our strategic visioning process and the campus planning update that will move forward alongside the visioning work that we are taking on together. Since then, we've taken several significant steps. Perhaps most importantly, we have charged Lori McCauley, our provost and vice president for executive affairs, Jeffrey Chattis, our Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Marshall Rungi, our Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs, with leading this visioning effort. Jeff's team 
will also lead the campus planning effort. I will, of course, be directly involved, and we will continue to engage with the entire community, the Board of Regents, as we cast a wide net to ensure broad engagement and the wisdom of this entire community. I look forward to reporting to the Board and to the University our progress, since that vision will reflect who we are, what we stand for as an institution, and what we will dare to become in the future as a great public university. A great university also requires a great leadership team. In that regard, I want to highlight two of the many important personnel items on the agenda for today's meeting. The extension of Provost Lori McCauley's service to a full term and a reappointment of Chancellor Domenico Grasso to a second five-year term at Dearborn. Let's hear it for both of them. Since even before I stepped on campus, Provost McCauley has proven to be an indispensable partner, a trusted and wise partner. She has launched initiatives on student success, faculty hiring, and increased support of faculty and campus academic infrastructure. And there's much more that she's going to do in the years ahead. She has provided critical support and insight in shaping new efforts and priorities. And most importantly, she's brought staunch and inspired leadership to not only the provost's office, but into the entire university community. Chancellor Grasso has done a fantastic job in his first term at Dearborn. He's been an educator, an innovator, a leader, and a trusted advisor. I've come to know him over the past several months, and I so appreciate his dedication and steadfast service, his commitment to students, staff, and faculty at Dearborn and beyond, and his devotion to this university. I could not imagine two better partners, and they will be integral to the achievements that we will achieve together. Those achievements will require infrastructure. At our meeting in December, we discussed our plan to lay the groundwork for the first housing that we've built specifically for first-year students since 1968. We'll be taking, talking much more about it as part of our regular agenda today. So I'll simply note that I am very pleased with our progress, and I look forward to working together to address the palpable student need that this will address. Each of us was a student at one point, and we remember our time in halls of residence. All of us here today, thanks to an educator, someone who saw something special in us, at a formative stage, who taught us, who opened our eyes, and who lifted our lives. And education is the greatest gift we can give. And it's in that light that I am so pleased to share with all of you that thanks to the incredible efforts of Dean Elizabeth Moji, who is right there in the front row to my right, we have received an historic gift for our School of Education. The Marcel family has made a commitment of $50 million, with our total giving to the school exceeding $55 million. And so, with the board's agreement, we will be renaming the school as the Marcel Family School of Education. Dean Moji is here with us today so please rise, Dean Moji, and join me in thanking her, not only for shepherding,
for shepherding this historic gift through, but also for her inspirational and aspirational service to a school of education of which we are all very proud. Thanks again, Dean Moji. Dean Moji will lead the implementation of this great gift, which will buttress initiatives designed to prepare and support a diverse population of teachers, build a robust partnership with schools and committees across this great state, and conduct research in collaboration with educational partners and practitioners. Even as we were the first American university to establish a chair exclusively devoted to education, the Marsal School of Education will ensure that we remain a leader in building our future through education. We are all so excited for those next steps. Now we've made an accomplished start, I would say, and we have an ambitious year ahead. I would like to call upon our provost, Provost McCauley, to introduce a supplemental action item and then call on Vice President Baird. Thank you, President Ono. Thank you for your support and trust. I'm very pleased to bring forward a supplemental action item for the naming of the School of Education. The School of Education has been one of our brightest beacons for more than 100 years. With the Marsal family's gift, which is unprecedented in the history of the school, we will be poised for another century of excellence. The school is well established as an international leader among its peers. It's ranked number one in education and educational research, according to the Center for World University Subject Rankings, and can claim six top 10 ranked specialty programs, according to the US News and World Report. Their latest gift will not only ensure the sustainability of the school and propel new areas of growth, but will also support initiatives to prepare and support a diverse population of teachers, build robust partnerships with schools and communities, and contribute broadly to education scholarship. Over the next several years, this will include developing a new undergraduate degree program, expanded work with the P20 partnership on the Mary Grove campus in Detroit, and supporting future educators. We are thrilled that the Marcel family has decided to intertwine their legacy with the School of Education. Under Dean Moji's leadership, which President Ono rightfully highlighted, we are confident the school will be equipped to deliver inspiring world-class programs to another generation of future educators. Vice President Baird. Thank you, Provost McCauley. I would like to add my appreciation for the Mar Marcel family's outstanding generosity. The proposed name intentionally represents the whole Marcel family, Kathleen and Brian Marcel, and her children, Megan Kirsch Marcel and Michael Marcel. Both Kathleen and Megan graduated from the University of Michigan School of Education. They have all served as tireless advocates for the School of Education with previous gifts supporting education, students, graduates, and future teachers. Their latest $50 million commitment is incredible, one of the largest gifts to any college of education in the country. It is truly transformational. Naming the school in their honor could not be a more fitting tribute for a family whose commitment to education and the School of Education in particular is undeniable. Thank you for considering the name in their honor the Marcel Family School of Education. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vice President Beard. Is there a motion to approve? Oh, no. Thank you. A seconder? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? The motion is approved unanimously. Congratulations, Dean Mojan. We will now proceed with the rest of our business for this meeting, and I'd look forward to seeing some of you at the inauguration. 
The next agenda item is the chair's report. Regent Brown. Thank you, President Ono. And again, like our president, I'd like to take this time uh, to say a few words about what happened in, in East Lansing. Uh, our worst fears were realized again and again and again. But we must remember the victims and we must all remember, especially the elected officials in this state and this country, to do our duty to keep each and every one of us safe. And today, we're all Spartans. Thank you. Um, uh, Regent Brown, are there other regents who'd like to speak? Regent Arthur. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, I, I also want to make a comment on uh, what happened at Michigan State. And uh, I've done a lot of thinking about this over the last couple of days. Um, again, we're in a position where we're talking about school shootings. I was thinking uh, yesterday that I, I remember deep, coming home from high school. I was 14 years old when Columbine happened. And I remember seeing on TV the same things that we see all the time now, the helicopter shots of students running and We've done this over and over again. It's 22 years since Columbine happened, 22 years. We've seen this in Sandy Hook. We've seen this in Uvalde, in Oxford, and now we see it at Michigan State. And now on Saturday night, uh, as everyone knows, we're playing Michigan State here in basketball, and we will probably have a moment of silence We'll probably honor those um, who are suffering. And um, what's so just disheartening about this is this will be the second time at a basketball game this season that we have had a moment of silence for a school shooting from another university, the University of Virginia, not that long ago. And I thought last night uh, about my colleagues and I who who went to the vigil and um, we, we signed um, and thinking about all of the young faces that come there wearing Oxford sweatshirts, wearing Sandy Hook sweatshirts, people that have grown up with this. This is three generations of students that we as leaders have failed. Let's be real about that, we failed. And, and the pain on everyone's faces last night, our students' faces, I think it's, it's important to note that it's okay not to feel okay right now. It really is. These are members of your community, high school classmates, friends, relatives. It's okay to feel that way. And it's okay to seek help. But as regents, we have an obligation, uh, as one of my colleagues says, and I will just quote him here, um, that Michigan should be physically safe and intellectually dangerous. And we have to work on the first part, being physically safe. And we are not physically safe as long as we live in a country where it is this easy to get weapons of war. So as, ele as elected leaders, we have an obligation to, to come up here and, and to talk about what's right for the university and what we should do, but we also have an obligation to advocate. So I wanna leave this just by saying that it's time that our elected leaders in Washington and especially in Lansing, don't wait and act now to make sure that we don't have another generation who has to go through what this generation is going through with weapons. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regent Acker. Any other regents? Regent Hubbard? Yeah, I'd just like to say as a regent from the Lansing area that uh, I too, you know, lived through this with a number of friends and family and others that uh, really were affected directly as they all live near the campus and heard the helicopters over my house and uh, I have a lot of concern and really feelings for all my friends at MSU. And um, I think maybe all of us here are wearing, you know, our, our bows and support of MSU. I know it's a small gesture, but I hope that our friends there do understand how much we're thinking of them and how much uh, we would like to offer our support to them in any way that we can. Thank you, Regent Hubbard. Any other? 
And I'd like to say something, President yes. Ono. Yes, we should. Thank, Thank you. Um, I just want to make a couple observations. Um, I think that the unthinkable and the unimaginable has happened. And it is heartbreaking and crushing. And what I would, what comes to mind for me is enough is enough. My heart goes out to all that experience this awful situation, especially the families who lost their loved ones. And um, I really challenge our newly elected legislature to study ways and pass laws to protect us, to protect Michiganders. And as Regent Acker said, I hope they do it and I hope they do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Illich. Any other comments? Back over to you, Regent Brown. Thank you, President. Thank you, President Ono. Um, in January, uh, we had the Regent's annual strategic meeting. Uh, the board spent time with President Ono and some of the executive officers discussing governance, the president's uh, strategic visioning process, campus master planning, and related strategic topics. We also got a sneak peek of the housing documents that will be presented to you later in this meeting. Uh, the president's strategic visioning process is so important and we look forward to regular updates and reports. Likewise, the campus planning activity will help us all as we plan for the future of our campuses in terms of housing, academic priorities, connectivity between parts of campus and the health system and more. We are all looking forward to an exciting 2023 including next month's official inauguration of our 15th president, President Santa Ono, on March 7th. Uh, we hope to see some of you uh, at many of the exciting events uh, that are in the works for this important day in our university's history. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Brown. We're now transitioning to committee reports. Regent Hubbard for the Finance, Audit, and Investment Committee. Yes, the Finance, Audit, and Investment Committee uh, did meet, and members of the committee and others from the Board of Regents met and received an internal audit update and a report on IT systems and security. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the Health Affairs Committee, Regent Bernstein. Thank you, President. Under the Health Affairs Committee, uh, including the full board, uh, met for an update on strategic affiliations, recent financial performance, and health system projects currently underway. The committee also received a snapshot of awards, advancements, and other highlights from U of M Health. Thank you very much, Regent Bernstein. We now transition to the consent agenda. Uh, the minutes and reports are on the website. Uh, and moving on to report, reports, reports will begin with one from Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, President Ono. Last night, uh, our student government also hosted a vigil on our campus where we gathered and shared our grief and sorrow with our extended academic family at Michigan State. I speak for the entire U of M Dearborn community in extending our deepest and most sincere condolences for the senseless and most tragic loss and harm that occurred earlier this week. We are all Spartans. Go green. I am also uh, honored and thankful to President Ono for recommending me for a, a second term. And I am very excited, hopefully, to begin after the vote of the regents to begin my second term with as much enthusiasm and en energy as I did my first term. Uh, earlier this uh, last week, we held our second annual State of the University Address, and we did it in, in a slightly different way. It was multimedia, where we had videos and invited faculty, staff, and students to participate in sharing our accomplishments and future plans. It was uh, well attended with over 200 uh, faculty members, staff, and students in attendance. Our campus uh, in Dearborn is all abuzz because Santa is coming to town again. <laughs> 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 and he will be joining us. President Ono is coming tomorrow for a reception with uh, faculty, staff, and students. And uh, we have a large number of people who have RSVP'd and will be in attendance. S many of our U of M Dearborn faculty members were recently included uh, in a Stanford University professor's uh, analysis of the top 2% 
of world scientists that have been cited, and we're very proud of the number of our faculty members which made this list. And finally, U of M Dearborn ranked second nationally for the number of Fulbright awards given to, uh, to um, faculty members in our cohort class this year. Thank you, that completes my report. Thank you very much. And we're indeed very proud of those accomplishments. And as I'm sure you know, the University of Michigan writ, lit, writ large is one of the top five or six institutions in terms of those highly cited scholars in the world. And so we're incredibly proud of the faculty of this institution. So thank you for that. Over to Chancellor Dutta for the uh, Flint campus report. Thank you, President Ono. And on behalf of everyone at U of M Flint, I extend profound sympathies to our friends and colleagues, students at Michigan State for the losses they have incurred and our prayers for those who are suffering physically or emotionally. We do have a campus uh, building of MSU in downtown Flint next to our campus, and our DPS has collaborated with MSU police to intensify patrols in that area and to reassure them. We have a strategic transformation town hall on campus tomorrow from 10 to 11.30. I invite everyone interested to attend in person or by Zoom. As a regional public university, we are constantly seeking and creating opportunities to positively impact the city and the county. In June 2020, Genesee County became one of the first communities in the country to adopt a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. Following that, U of M faculty, Lisa LaPerouse, and MSU faculty, Kent Kay, and several U of M Flint students launched the Beyond Rhetoric Project. It is a community action council to develop and implement community-wide strategic plan to end racist policies and practices in Genesee County. Our College of Health Sciences students, as a part of their leadership and interprofessional teamwork, a trio of physician assistant students and our DPS have collaborated with Genesee Community Health Center on a vending machine project. This is to provide fentanyl testing strips and free Narcan in downtown Flint. Narcan is a life-saving medication <coughs> that reverses opioid overdoses. So these are just two examples of the collaborative work you have filled faculty and student do with the Flint and Genesee County partners. During January 11th through 15th, nearly 800 theater students from throughout the Midwest arrived at U of M Flint as we hosted the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival for Region 3, organized nationally by the John F. Kennedy Center for, for Performing Arts. Eight regional festivals were organized throughout the country. And finally, our College of Innovation and Technology's Vehicle City Baja team competed this year in the Winter Baja races hosted at Michigan Tech. Our team had a strong showing. They finished in the middle of the 44 team field and ahead of some of the teams from flagship institutions like Kansas, University of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Ohio State University. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Now I invite the uh, president of the Central uh, Student Government, Noah Zimmerman, for his report. President Ono, members of the Board of Regents, members of the administrations, and fellow Wolverines, good afternoon. Monday's tragic incident in Michigan State has left us all deeply shaken. As Wolverines, we stand united with our neighbors in East Lansing, offering our support and heartfelt condolences during this difficult time. While we grieve the loss of life beyond our community, 
We recognize the profound impact this senseless act of violence has had on our own. In the face of adversity, our University of Michigan student body has demonstrated remarkable strength and resilience. Through a vigil last night, we came together to honor those we have lost and to lend support to one another. I wanna thank my Vice President Jackie Hillman and Speaker Karthik Pasapula for their hard and diligent work in helping to organize this event. We will, we will be delivering the banner that thousands signed to our counterparts at MSU next week. In this trying time, we must continue to stand as one, offer solace, and listen with open hearts as we navigate the road ahead. Looking forward, we remain fully committed to the vision and initiatives outlined in our winter semester plan. We're excited to collaborate with various student organizations and university departments to launch a slate of upcoming events, including our second Wellbeing Day, a movie night on the Diag, a 5K fundraiser in the ARB, civic engagement week programming, and the upcoming CSG elections. Through these events and our joint efforts, we are confident that we'll be able to create a positive and lasting impact on our campus. With great pleasure, Jackie and I would also like to announce the success of our town hall series thus far. Through our dedicated efforts in advancing long-term mental health care solutions, we're proud to have enabled the provision of complementary telehealth therapy solutions to every Michigan student starting at the end of this month. Our latest town hall meeting focused on co-curricular accessibility and has motivated us to spearhead the centralization of a space reservation system that prioritizes accessibility needs. Moreover, we will continue to tackle important topics with key stakeholders and connect student organizations with administrators. Regrettably, we cannot turn a blind eye to the dire and urgent issue of gun violence that not only threatens our campus, but our nation. This epidemic has transcended the confines of political discourse and has become a matter of life and death for us, the students. Throughout history, students at U of M have been a force of collective power at the forefront of timely policy issues. Now this issue demands that we use our voices to call upon the university to take swift, decisive, and purposeful action. I implore the Board of Regents, President Ono, and Vice President Kolb, with your significant personal and political influence uh, to summon courage and leadership to tackle this problem head on. We cannot remain idle while the lives of our fellow students and community members are in peril. We must take meaningful steps to ensure the safety and well-being of our students and the broader community. The time for complacency and inaction is over. Let us join forces and work together to confront this challenge on the local, state, and federal levels. By advocating for and passing stronger legislation, we can effectively create a safer and more secure environment for everyone. Finally, we must remember that seeking help is an act of strength, not weakness. As Wolverines, we stand together and extend kindness, support, and understanding to those who may be struggling. We also recognize the profound impact this tragedy has on our Spartan peers and stand ready to offer our unwavering support. Let us remain united in our shared humanity and compassion, with Wolverines standing for Spartans in all communities in need. In closing, CSG welcomes the opportunity to hear from our fellow students on issues that are important to them, and we look forward to collaborating with the board and administration to advocate for the needs of all Wolverines. Thank you, and go blue. Thank you very much, and thank you for your leadership, both of you and the collaboration, and we will work with you for all of those, on all of those initiatives. We ne next turn to the retirement memoirs that are in the materials, and we just want to recognize the tremendous contributions of these uh, faculty members to the core mission of the institution. The memorials are also in the materials, uh, and we remember these individuals for their contributions to scholarship and also teaching at the University of Michigan. We now turn to the degrees, uh, the lists uh, for approval. Uh, and uh, I now call for a vote on the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion? Yes. Seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? The consent agenda has been approved unanimously. Now we move on to the regular agenda, um, and we move on to uh, the sale of University of Michigan Health West um, and the interest in health bridge skilled nursing and rehabil rehabilitation center. Um, Vice President Chattis, I think, is joining us by Zoom. Yes, Mr. President, nothing to add. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? 
motion passes unanimously. We now move on to PHB Medicare capital contribution request. VP Chattis. Nothing to add, Mr. President. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Motion passes unanimously. Now move on to the new Michigan Marching Band practice field. VP Chattis. Mr. President, before we move on to that item, I wanted to report some good news from the athletics department. The Michigan Stadium scoreboard project was originally approved by the Regents at $41 million, but after all of the bid packs came in, we anticipate the cost to be closer to $37 million. Due to that favorable bid result mentioned above, we took the opportunity to get pricing on several of our other facilities whose scoreboards were reaching the end of life, which is typically eight to 10 years for exterior boards, and utilize some of those savings. I'm pleased to announce that we will now replace the video boards at field hockey, soccer, baseball, softball, and Cliff Keen Arena. The replacement of these video boards will not start until after the spring athletic seasons are complete, but will be done in time for the start of the fall, and the entire project will be paid out of gift funds. So now, Mr. President, it is my pleasure to introduce the architects Graham Wyatt and Kevin Smith from the Robert A.M. Stern Architects, who will share the final design and layout for this new wonderful practice field. Thank you, Vice President Chattis, and I'm pleased to be here today, President Ono, Regents, Welcome. members of the administration, members of the University of Michigan community. I'm here to talk about two very exciting and interrelated projects. Uh, one of them is a replacement facility for the Michigan Marching Band, um, El Bell Field, and related to that, we'll speak about it in a moment, is a new facility which the President has mentioned already related to um, undergraduate first and second year housing. Here you see on the screen in front of you uh, two slides side by side. On the left hand side, existing conditions of the two pieces of property in question. And for orientation, uh, the central campus is slightly to the upper right-hand corner of both of those slides and the main athletic facilities are at the lower edge. Uh, one of those pieces of property so labeled is the existing uh, Fingerly or former Fingerly Lumberyard purchased by the university and the second is the existing Elbel Field and Recreation Fields uh, which are located south of Hill Street. Uh, both of those properties are uh, connected in the realization of this uh, new vision, and you will see it on the right-hand slide where it says proposed condition. Uh, we are proposing uh, to build a new facility for the Michigan Marching Band practice, uh, resolving a variety of challenges that they face in their current facility, uh, moving them to a much higher level of functionality, and at the same time, uh, freeing property which would then be used for the proposed student housing. Um, here on the second slide, I'm zooming in on the uh, former Fingerly property, and I'll call attention to some of the features that exist right now. Uh, it is a flat site adjacent to the rail tracks, but it's an excellent opportunity to provide new facilities for the Michigan Marching Band. Uh, why is it better? One of the most fundamental changes is it allows for a practice field which replicates the field in the big house. So the previous uh, marching band facility is oriented east-west. This new one is a much more desirable northwest, north and south. The end zones, um, the sidelines, all of those dimensions are commensurate with the experience that the marching band will have as they um, uh, perform in the big house. Also, facilities that they don't currently have uh, to the left called partial field allows for uh, further practice and sectional practices for portions of the band uh, which do not currently have adequate facilities for that. And far more detail than I can go into today, but there are um, new field lights and new video boards, expanded bleachers and instructional tower, all of this providing a quality of facilities which we believe will become the envy of other competing teams. Also on this site, there will be at the north and the south open landscape space which is available for members 
of the university's use, but also members of the Ann Arbor community. And here, a quick view of what that would look like. This simply shows a diagonal view across the main field. Uh, behind the flags to the left would be the partial field. You can see the exhibit stand, um, the instructional stand. And um, so this is a, truly a state-of-the-art facility, and we're very proud to be able to work on it. Thank you. I believe I pass this now to Provost, to Provost Macaulay. Macaulay. That's right. Thank you to our guests from RAMSA for sharing details on this incredible new practice facility for our Michigan marching band. This new field will truly be a state-of-the-art outdoor classroom for band students. Dave Gear, our Dean of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance is with us here today in the front row, as is John Pasquale, the director of the Michigan Marching Band who I am going to invite to share comments about the impact this new field will have on our band program. Professor Pasquale. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Pasquale, and I have the privilege of being the director of the Michigan Marching and Athletic Bands. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you. Just before we begin, I just want to let people know that I stutter. I hope it doesn't make anyone uncomfortable. If I add about 20 seconds, that's why I'm trying to keep this brief. But on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the marching and athletic bands, I would like to thank the Board of Regents, university officials, and Dean Gear for the support of, of, uh, of our project. As a professor in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, I am honored and extremely fortunate to work with such brilliant and talented students. And I take very seriously the mission to provide them um, with the best possible instructional and artistic experience. And this new field complex um, is gonna do exactly that because it is gonna set a new standard in marching band instruction and provide MMB students with a state-of-the-art classroom space that's gonna redefine uh, uh, boundaries of instructional efficiency, uh, a student assessment and creative output. I very much look forward to the completion of this project pending, of course, uh, approval by the board. And, um, and then for us to begin uh, preparations for our 126th season, where we will support the team, entertain the best fans in the world, and continue to uphold the storied legacy and tradition of excellence that defines the School of Music, Theater, and Dance and Michigan BAM program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pasquale. President Ono, we recommend that the Board of Regents approve the design for the new Michigan Marching Band practice field as presented and authorize proceeding with construction. Thank you very much. Is there uh, someone putting forward the motion? motion? Second. Seconder. Great. All those in favor? Say aye. Anyone opposed? Say aye. Anyone abstaining? The motion passes unanimous, unanimously. Congratulations, John. I understand that uh, you're going to be uh, here again for the second item, which is the uh, new central campus residential development. And we're very excited about that. But VP Harmon. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. We believe in building something that will endure and have a positive impact by creating more spaces where students can find and make the sort of on campus living community that speaks to them, a place that centers sustainability and community well-being in every aspect of its design. And we continue to gather extensive student input for this new facility because student feedback is critical to the overall success of the project. Now I'm pleased to reintroduce the Robert A.M. Stern Architects representatives, Graham Wyatt and Kevin Smith, who will present the schematic design for the significant, much needed addition to our on-campus housing offerings. Thank you very much. Back at the podium. There we are. 
So the second half of the site that I spoke about a moment ago, which is part of an extraordinarily important initiative at the University of Michigan and working at other universities across the United States, I can say that in this time, as we come out of a pandemic, few things have been demonstrated to be more important than the quality of the on-student, on-campus student residential experience. So we're really honored to be part of this project. This a site that you see in front of you in the slide represents the property bounded by Hill Street in the north, Hoover on the south, and South Division. Um, and it would be the home of 2,300 new beds of student housing and a 900 seat dining hall facility, um, primarily uh, two thirds of it allocated to first year students and approximately one third to second year students. It's a large enough development that it consists of a series of buildings. So think of it as a precinct, not a building development. And in true Michigan fashion, those buildings are used to figure and contain outdoor spaces that have programmatic elements to them and are part of the on-campus student residential experience. A little bit about the ground floor plan. Here are diagrammatic ground floors and the a point that is being made, the uh, dark arrows represent broad, naturally lit corridors that will bring students from the front doors of each of these residence halls to the elevators and stairs where they rise to the floors above. Important point as each student comes in, they come in from the main quadrangle. Straight ahead of them, they see a lounge. On this floor, there are a series of amenities, and we've worked quite hard uh, with um, students to develop an appropriate amenity package, and then they rise to the residential floors above. Also of great significance here is a new 900 seat dining hall. Uh, most of the seats are at the ground level and they are entered directly from a pair of large archways right at the heart of that main quadrangle. There will be a variety of different uh, menus and different seating options. And above this, there are areas such as an instructional kitchen, which again came out of discussions directly with students. Um, at the upper floor, the way in which this is organized is very much focused on the on-campus student residential experience. And so here are floor plans that show in blue areas that are allocated for first year students and in the gold color uh, for second year students and the room types are slightly different and the way in which they're organized is for specifically for community arrangements which are appropriate to those years. Again, very much based on input from students. And finally, uh, a quick tease of what this will look like. Uh, we hope that people will agree that this is um, absolutely consistent with the fabric and the spirit of the University of Michigan uh, buildings, which vary in height from five to seven stories, um, running along the street, but with uh, landscaping, an archway in the center of this view, which leads through into that main quadrangle that you saw a moment ago, comparable in size to the law school quadrangle. And finally, a view in the opposite direction, looking north, a central tower, which includes some community rooms and its ground level, the entrance to that main dining hall. So we're very pleased to push this forward and honored to be part of this important project. Thank you. Thank you very much. And these are beautiful uh, schematics and it's been really a pleasure working with you over the past several uh, weeks. Uh, uh, VP Chatters. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you to the architects for sharing the design for this historic project. These new housing and dining facilities will help ensure that we can provide more equitable access to affordable on-campus housing for our students. It will also create a beautiful new residential neighborhood on our campus that will create a stronger connection between our Central and Ross athletic campuses. To create the possibility of expanding this residential neighborhood in the future, we are seeking approval to begin the process of acquiring the property necessary to enable a potential phase two of the South Fifth housing development. In summary, we recommend the board approve two items. One, the schematic design and authorization to proceed with the new central campus residential development. And two, to approve the resolution in the action item, which will allow the university to acquire property needed for phase two of the housing expansion. Thank you. Thank you very much, VP Chattis. Yeah, uh, President Monarch, a question maybe for uh, Graham or Kevin or Jeff. How does this uh, 
project, these projects fit into our carbon neutrality commitments? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to start and then Graham could join in, but we have, is he up there? I can't see, but he, we've, we have, we have had uh, sustainability at the cornerstone of the design and planning to ensure that it is uh, the most sustainable residential hall, certainly for us and consistent with our goals towards carbon neutrality. Graham? Yes, I would say that that's the key point. It's consistent with the university's carbon neutrality goals. And it does that in a variety of ways, which are focused on energy, but also focus on a variety of other resource efficiencies, which go beyond energy use alone. And we're taking this very seriously because it's consistent with the university's commitment, but we also take it very seriously because it's the right thing to do. And because your students are correctly very concerned with these issues. Thank you very much. VP uh, Chattis, did you mention uh, a statement that uh, has been received? Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to. The Voices yeah. for Common Neutrality have also reviewed this project and have issued a statement in support of this as a significant step towards our commitment towards the carbon neutrality. Regent Brown? I'd also like to take the opportunity to point out and thank. Uh, first, I'll point out the fact that this project would absolutely not be possible uh, without the agreement uh, and the expertise in the work of Regent Ron Weiser, who currently owns the vast majority uh, of those properties and his willingness uh, to turn them over uh, to the University of Michigan with absolutely zero profit or benefit uh, to himself. So once again, Regent Weiser, you've done amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. I, I seem to recall, uh, VP Chattis, this is uh, intended to be a, a lead platinum building. Is that correct? That is correct. That's great. That's wonderful. Any other questions or comments? Okay, great. Um, is there a motion to approve both action items? So, so moved. Seconded. Great. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? This exciting project has been approved unanimously. Congratulations, everyone. We will be postponing to a further meeting, uh, discussion about UM recreational sports fields, and we'll move on to uh, conflict of interest items, items 7 to 15. Uh, they require six votes minimum for approval. Uh, would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any of the items? If so, please let us know now. Seeing none, I now call for a vote on items 7 through 15. Is there a motion to approve? Seconded. Great. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? That's wonderful. We now move on to item seven. No. <laughs> Authorization for the university to enter into an agreement with Ganesh Design LLC, VP Chattis. Nothing to add, Mr. President. All right, they've all been approved. Yeah. We're now into other other items. Um, VP Churchill is going to discuss Regents Bylaw 3.10 or 3.10 on ownership of patents and copyrights. Nothing. Chairman, support. Wonderful. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Regents Bylaw is approved unanimously. Approval of the updated academic calendar for 2023-2024. This is of great interest. In Ann Arbor, Provost McCauley. Nothing to add. Motion to approve. So moved. Any seconder? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? The uh, academic calendar uh, has been approved. Congratulations. But now we move on to public comments. Uh, VP Churchill. Good afternoon. We have a number of speakers and each speaker has up to two minutes to address the board at the mic in the middle. And uh, you'll hear a beeper go off if you go over that time. Our first speaker is uh, Jaquendri Brown. Hello, chancellors, regents, president. My name is Jaquendri Brown and I'm a center for student government of the Flint campus. 
but more importantly, I'm a student of said campus. And I'm here to represent the university in regards to the strategic transformation project that is ongoing at our campus. When it comes to the transformation pro process itself, there have been avenues to get in contact with the Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Data, and I appreciate that there have been ways to contact them, as I believe communication is key to having a health, healthy campus. However, the same cannot be said for the group that is leading the charge for said transformation, the Huron Consulting Group. This group has is known for having analysis resulting in cuts for departments and the firing for staff and, for, and for faculty, like in the University of Wisconsin. And I and many others on my campus do not want the same to happen here. But as it turns out, the assumed malicious intent from said group soon became recognized as incompetency. I say this because the group filed their second report, which didn't specify any of the data and had known errors like putting departments in their analysis that haven't been around for over three years such as African studies. I'm speaking to you, you all to question why, why are we, as the one of the most critically claimed universities in the world, um, relying on a group that can, can't even get their facts right. We are rubber wings. We lead. We don't follow incompetency. I hope that everyone here considers that, considers what I said here, and let's show the world that we can get things done and not rely on a group that has been, for lack of better words, lackluster to say the best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anna Lemire, but I'm not sure. Is Anna here? I am. I'm so oh, good. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lemler, and I'm a resident here in Ann Arbor, as well as an alum of Michigan's Master of Social Work program, class of 2016. And I'm representing the Care Based Safety Team, which is an independent, local, multiracial group of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti community members and leaders who are creating care based safety for all in our community. We grew out of the Coalition for Re Envisioning Our Safety, which is based in Ann Arbor. In CBS, we believe that our community includes the safety of those at the university and on or near campus. Like GEO, we want to ensure the safety of the most vulnerable people and workers. And so we're building a community-based urgent response program with a team of skilled responders who are thoroughly trained and values aligned. After over a year of rigorous research and integration of public health frameworks from the American Public Health Association, this program design includes both urgent response and skill training for lay people to equip them with options to respond to crisis and harm in a safe and caring way. We believe the university campus should be included in these programmatic efforts. Established local and national funders are showing their interest and commitment to this type of programming, and we hope you all will join nationwide calls for care based safety as well. Our budget includes the appropriate staffing for such an intensive program from leadership to responders and dispatch to outreach operations and organizational partnerships, as well as the actual equipment and materials that are required. The cost to cover the university's portions for this robust, robust program is an estimated two quarter million, whether through direct funds, contracted agreements of personnel or resources, or other configurations of reciprocity. The program design is currently being refined through community co-creation sessions, which are already showing us how eager people, including those on campus, are for such a program. With your support, the University of Michigan staff, faculty, graduate and undergraduate students, and the community as a whole could be impacted by such critical and life-affirming services. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Sachs. Hello, my name is Kim Sachs, and I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of Michigan Flint. I've also been part of a series of town halls organized on my campus by staff, faculty, students, and community members. And today I wanna to speak to the concerns raised at these events. We all agree that we are at an inflection point in Flint. And I wanna be clear, we support some sort of transformation. However, Huron's analysis has major flaws in it as outlined in the handout we have brought here today and mentioned by my student Jaquindre. U of M Flint isn't suffering enrollment declines because it lacks relevant programs. U of M Flint lacks necessary resources and admissions, student support, campus facilities, and more. Starting new programs or ending old ones will not solve these problems. But the strategic transformation is now being used as an excuse to shuffle disciplines and departments without proper analysis or faculty governance. For example, why are there efforts to move units before the strategic planning is complete? 
This is destabilizing and will deter quality students from attending. Further, we're already losing good faculty who feel confused and undervalued. This is not a sustainable transformation. We need to look no further than Central Michigan University to see what comes next. They too spent tens of millions of dollars to fund what consultants told them were the next big things, all at the expense of current programs with strong community and alumni ties. And 10 years down the road, their enrollment is down an additional 43%. The people of Flint and the students of U of M Flint, past, present, and future, deserve to know that their institution is in good hands. ITAC, student government, faculty, Senate council have all rung the alarm. It's time to pump the brakes. And so I have three asks. One, pause any discipline or college transfers until a review of governance processes can be undertaken by President Ono or his designee. Two, mandate Huron publish their data and methods in full, post haste, before any decisions are made. And three, require that funding be distributed equitably amongst new and existing academic programs. Thank you. Thank you. Larissa Magnus. Hello, uh, my name is Larissa Mednis. I'm a current Master's of Social Work student here at the University of Michigan and the co-chair of Payment for Placements, an organization of MSW students working to ensure that all of us receive the equivalent of $20 or more per hour for our degree required field placement work. Me and my classmates are struggling across the board. We must work for 912 hours to receive our degrees, which amounts to 16 or 24 hours per week when we would otherwise be taking unpaid work to make ends meet. As of now, about 88% of us receive no form of compensation for our field work, myself included. Because this issue is pertinent and urgent for graduate students at UM, GEO is proposing payment for MSW field placements as a memorandum of understanding to be included in the 2023 contract. So far, academic HR has refused to engage with the union on this and many other proposals that we have brought to the bargaining table. They refuse to bargain over payment for placements on the condition that it is a permissive subject of bargaining and doesn't directly impact the working conditions of GSIs and GSSAs. However, permissive does not mean the university does not have the ability and obligation to consider a proposal that would have a drastic impact on our graduate students' standard of living. Lest I remind the board that academic HR insisted on bargaining over ground rules of our sessions, a permissive subject that we discussed for three months before HR passed a single counter proposal to GEO. Are permissive subjects only relevant when they defend the interests of the university or will academic HR follow through on rectifying the financial crisis faced by thousands of graduate student workers at this university? We're sacrificing additional times from our busy schedules to research and present realistic proposals that the university can easily afford and implement. When will we be taken seriously and receive real counter proposals with real solutions to our problems? Thank you. Thank you. Brent Klaus. Good evening, President Ono, senior staff and regents. My name is Brett Close, and I have one of six senior undergraduates working on our capstone project with Equitable Ann Arbor Land Trust, or EA2. I would like to start by thanking Regent Hubbard for meeting with my teammates, Andrea and Emily last week to discuss the university's 10 year strategic visioning plan and offering us invaluable insights. As a catalyst for a better Ann Arbor, we envision beginning with a pillar of the community the Michigan Medical Campus. As you know, the university's hospital system is world renowned and ever growing. This is why we chose to start by interviewing over 40 hospital staff members where we identified 76% of them arrive at work an average of 45 minutes early in the hopes of finding a parking spot on top of an already lengthy commute. It is common to spend north of two hours getting to and from work each day. This is time spent away from families and other obligations, time that we believe you have the power to give back to them. With 1,600 at new, added new jobs at the new hospital, most of whom will be new commuters to an already burdened parking system, we are near a tipping point. To start down this path, we see opportunities to address EA2's three main goals of affordability, climate action, and walkability. 
We must maximize the potential of underutilized land owned by the university to create affordable workforce housing and build community along Fuller Road. This solution offers the shared benefit of aligning with the university's stated climate goals, such as reducing vehicle output per passenger to ensure more folks who work in Ann Arbor can live in Ann Arbor. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. You want to say something? Yeah, Regent Hubbard. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Uh, appreciate the call out. It was really great to meet with the team and Emily and uh, Asher, I think, coming up soon and the others. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to your results and your report. And uh, I wish you the best of luck because it is a problem the Board of Regents is directly grappling with. And so I think the information that your group pulls together will be very instructive to our discussion and know that we'll take it seriously. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I believe our next speaker has called in sick, but it's Al Tante. I just want to make sure Al isn't here. Okay, so then our next speaker is Asher Kripke. Good evening, President Ono, administrators, and regents. <clears throat> My name is Asher, and I'm a senior continuing the discussion Brett introduced. We have an opportunity to alleviate several significant challenges facing the community while furthering the university's climate action goals. As Brett laid out, the parking situation is a nightmare for commuters and creates unwalkable streets. Currently, these parking lots along Fuller Road are inconvenient and dangerous. Imagine, instead of a dead zone of empty cars, a riverfront village providing affordable and workforce housing while connecting north and medical campuses along the river. A truly modern space with ground level shops and locally owned eateries, with built in parking decks and housing for university employees. This solution addresses three primary challenges in alignment with the university's sustainability goals. First, affordable housing options give hospital workers an opportunity to live in Ann Arbor reducing their commute, congestion, and overall emissions. Second, these units can be constructed with a focus on carbon neutrality, ready aligning with the university's climate action goals. And third, we can create a thriving community along the Huron with vibrant ground floor shops and entertainment below accessible housing. Overall, this plan lessens the environmental impact of commuting and alleviates the burden for some of the region's most important workers, our Michigan medicine staff. These projects may sound like a lot to embark on, but my group mate, Andrea, will talk about creating these benefits for the university and our community while minimizing the burden on the university's shoulders. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Desiree Simmons. Hello, good evening. I'm Desiree Simmons. I'm speaking as a matter of care-based safety, um, Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice co-director, Ypsilanti City Council member, previous staff member of U of M, and all of who I am. I understand the complexities of doing HR at a large public university where the workers are also students, the places where the workers live, work, learn, and play are all the same, and to create a work environment where everyone feels safe and cared for no matter their race, ethnicity, citizenship, status, and all of who they are it can be a behemoth challenge. But the idea that solutions to increase safety are outside of the bounds of bargaining is disingenuous. When we know that workers have won battles for safety through contract negotiations for much of time. The program that Care-Based Safety is proposing would allow an option to address conflicts and mental health crisis with community care from the beginning. It would create a mobile hub to help connect folks with resources that they may not know about one, we know that University of Michigan is huge. How can one person even know all the resources available here? Or they could be from out of town, so they wouldn't know about resources that are in the surrounding area. And in a time of crisis, who can remember all of the resources that are available to you? 
It also would allow for a relational team that would bring care into a space of community after community trauma, like gun violence, which we unfortunately know continues to be on the rise. Geo and all of those who live, work, and learn here deserve to feel safe. And it is time for the administration to recognize that current security measures do not equal safety for all, and more and more people are feeling less and less safe. GEO deserves real answers and counters for their concerns, including the one for an unarmed response team. It is time for leaders and best to catch up with the future. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Jansen. Good evening, President Ono, senior staff and regents. My name is Andrea and I'm excited to continue the conversation my colleagues Brett and Asher began earlier regarding our work with EA2. We have laid out the challenges the university is facing with housing and transit and have offered a cohesive solution that not only addresses the problem, but also strengthens the Ann Arbor community and contributes to climate goals. With that said, the university is already embarking on multiple ambitious projects, including a new dorm at Elbel and a monorail to connect to North Campus. Our proposed initiatives offer great value to the university, but how feasible are they given the current plans? Well, quite feasible actually. A master public-private partnership that leverages the private sector and the university's relationship with the city would allow the university to capitalize on the benefits we have laid out. President Ono also has a proven track record at public-private partnerships in Cincinnati and Vancouver. With the growing problem at hand comes a golden opportunity to work together and create meaningful change during your tenure. Starting with the hospital and Riverfront, we have the chance to resolve a pressing issue for our Michigan medical staff by offering affordable housing options on current parking lots for workers the university cannot afford to lose, while contributing to sustainability initiatives and creating a more walkable community. Revitalize, revitalizing these deficient university lots is a win-win for everyone involved. It demonstrates respect toward hospital workers who don't want to worry about menial tasks such as parking and walking to work ahead of an already pressure-packed 12-hour shift. It aligns with the university's goals on immediate climate action, and it builds a more walkable Ann Arbor with better access to the wonderful natural features along the Huron River. Thank you very much for your time. We will follow up with Regents, President Ono, and your senior staff via email to share more information as we hope to schedule an opportunity to speak directly to gain insights on how to bring our plans to life and to enhance the university and city we all cherish. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Cook. Good evening. Um, my name is Justice Cook. I'm a master's student at the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan and a member of Payment for Placements. I stand before you to address an important subject that affects the livelihoods of all social work students. We must acknowledge that expecting social work students to complete their field placements without payment is not only unfair, but it also perpetuates systemic inequities. While our field placement provides valuable learning opportunities and hands-on experience, we must recognize that it also comes at a cost. Many students in lower socioeconomic status do not have the financial resources to support themselves while working an unpaid internship. This is not only inequitable, but it also perpetuates the cycle of poverty and systemic oppression. We must also acknowledge that expecting students to work unpaid internships disproportionately affects marginalized communities. I'd like to state that I have an incredible amount of privilege and yet I am still struggling. I've had to quit my job in order to have time for my field hours. I cannot get approved for more loans to cover my cost of living. I've had to skip meals, I'm on Medicaid, and I live with a friend who's letting me crash with him so that I don't have to live in my car anymore. I've spoken with classmates who are working multiple jobs on top of field and class, and I have no idea how they do it. I urge you to seriously consider our proposal. The university has claimed to care about increasing the diversity of underrepresented groups as part of the DEI strategic plan and providing financial compensation to your students would not only level the playing field, but it would also help break down the barriers that prevent marginalized communities from being able to access an education. I implore you to join us in the fight for equity and justice. Let us 
work together to ensure that all of our social work students have equal access to the opportunities that they need to succeed, regardless of their socioeconomic status, race, or sexual orientation. Thank you. Thank you. Garima Panwar. Hi, I'm Garima Singh, a fourth year PhD student and a GEO member. Today, I would like to talk about a serious workplace issue that we all face of sexual harassment and discrimination. We have all heard about high profile cases like former provost Martin Filbert and Robert Anderson. But these are just symptoms of a much broader issue. University of Michigan Climate Survey, NGOs on surveys have told us how little faith grad workers have in, uh, in the reporting mechanisms that are currently in place in the university. This is a serious problem which require a much serious attention. We got really excited when we heard about the new LSA transitional funding program, which was created to reduce and mitigate uh, the power imbalance in the trainee mentorship uh, relationship and provide immediate financial support for masters and PhD trainees who are dependent upon a faculty advisor for funding so that the trainee can exist, exit a harassing or abusive relationship and transition, transition to a new advisor without losing continuity of financial support. We have been closely monitoring this funding and we found that it leaves most of the grad students out. As a part of our current negotiation with academic HR, we want this LSA funding to expand and include all grad workers. And as a way of safeguarding grad workers, we want funding processes to be separated from reporting mechanisms. The LSA working group, which consists of nationally renowned experts, recommend that there should be funding mechanisms to support LSA uh, graduate students who have to leave harassing situations so that they can make this transition without losing funding. The same working group also suggests that compulsory reporting when victim isn't ready causes more harm and trauma. This is the premise of our uh, proposal with DHR. Also, this kind of funding is not unheard of. For instance, MIT and Columbia provide a similar funding, a no question asked transitional funding to their grad students. And ever since we started negotiations with the academic HR, a dean from another R1 university reached out to GEO asking about how did we implement this funding. Unfortunately, HR has failed to consider seriousness of our issue. They have rejected all our proposals. We request the regents to talk to HR and so that they take our uh, proposals considerably seriously and then we can together make University of Michigan truly leaders and best. Thank you. Savoya Davis. Hello, my name is Savoya Davis. I'm a graduate student instructor here. COVID-19 continues to harm our campus community. Since October of 2022, members of our community who share health concerns have been trying to reach the university administration, but have been shut down at every effort. Faculty members have made attempts to meet with various decision makers regarding this issue, but were also denied. Multiple open letters were drafted, over 700 combined signatures, and 76 testimonials were collected, and we've even emailed President Ono requesting a meeting regarding this issue. We were denied a meeting with no, expl no explanation, and our concerns were dismissed. Because we have exhausted all avenues trying to get the administration, administration's attention, efforts have been shifted to winning workplace health and safety protections and GEO contract negotiations. After witnessing the atrocious disregard and apathy by HR during bargaining, I'm fully convinced that if one of us die right now here after catching COVID at this university, the administration wouldn't bat an eyelash. HR is not taking our problems seriously and are bargaining in bad faith. They won't even acknowledge the current harm university COVID policy is causing us or the danger it poses for our immunocompromised colleagues. When asked if HR agreed that COVID poses a health and safety risk to graduate workers, including those of us who are immunocompromised, your chief negotiator, Katie DeLong, replied, I can't speak to that. I've personally observed the same indifference for the overall well-being of graduate workers from DeLong and her team towards every proposal presented by the union. The counter proposals HR present during bargaining sessions are nonsensical. We are tired of the overt disregard for our humanity this administration continuously displays. You have the opportunity to fix this, kindly do better. And to President Santa Ono, the invitation still stands if you would like to meet with us 
concerning our health and safety concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Karasik. Karasik Nisupla. Good afternoon. My name is Karthik Pasapula, and I'm a senior double majoring in PPE and economics. I'm a member of CSG and YDSA, and I'm speaking today in support of GEO. I can count on one of my hands the number of times I've skipped class, and this is one of those times. From the administration's contract offers to GEO, it's really unreally uncomfortable to see that the university cares less about who's teaching me than I do. Just in case you didn't know, GSIs in Ann Arbor earn $24,050. According to MIT's living wage calculator, a living wage in Ann Arbor would be $38,537. That's a difference of more than $14,500. I don't think most of you are renters, but to renters like regular students and GSIs, this is literally more than, a worth, more than a year's worth of rent. Just think about that for a second. One of the wealthiest public institutions in the world is paying GSIs less than a living wage. And when GSIs are asking for a drop in a drop in a bucket, it's, it's unbelievable. As an econ major, this makes no sense to me. I mean, we're talking about workers that directly interact and educate with students on a daily basis. One of the biggest money makers the university has. Not only this, but the fact that the university only offers GSIs an average of 2.5% raise, even lower to workers in Dearborn and Flint campuses is mind blowing. This is literally a pay cut. With cost of living adjustments, let's think in that you're proposing a salary cut to GSIs. What's even crazier to me is how the university justifies this in an email to faculty and staff are that GSIs are part-time workers. President Ono, Regents, Last time I checked, my utility bills come year round. I don't think it's different for any of you. However, the university treats, treats its workers like they only pay bills for six to eight months out of the year, even though they make money for the university for all 12 months of the year with the work that they do. With how much you're paying GSIs, you're basically telling them and all of us that you work more than 40 times harder than they do, which is blatantly untrue and something I think even you can agree with me on. Please pay your GSIs a living wage and show that we are truly leaders and best. Thank you. Natalie Leach. Um, hi, my name is Nat, and I am a current second year undergrad student in LSA, and today I'm here to tell you about my experience with mental health support on campus. Um, and before I get too far, I also want to give a content warning for suicide mentions. Um, okay. Last September, I moved into my dorm after leaving my hometown where I'd endured years of abuse and where I first tried to take my life at 12, then 14, then 18. I never received medical intervention until October of 2021 when I reached out to CAP, CAPS on campus. I had to wait two weeks for my initial appointment, and after one call that felt rushed and disingenuous, I didn't show up to my next scheduled call. My assigned case manager never followed up. About a week later, I was in the psych ER at Michigan Medicine because I knew that my next attempt would be successful. After that, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, CPTSD, and other correlated disorders. Well, I know that that CAPS counselor reaching out just one more time likely could have spared me the trauma of having to be hospitalized further away from my home due to a lack of psych staff at Michigan Medicine. I also know that there is one way to ensure that nobody else also has to experience what I have. In the same way that providing a dignified wage and benefits to nurses is correlated with better care and a reduction of staffing shortages and per capita workload, the same basic changes will prevent people like me and anyone else on campus from slipping through the cracks because there are too many cases to cover for too little in return. Legitimate mental health care is never possible when the people providing it are materially struggling, be it licensed medical professionals already or masters of social work students like my therapist was here at Michigan. And everyone knows that a few pen strokes and contract agreements here can change it. Um, and I also want, oh, never mind. Are the, uh, are the, Carmen. Uh, before you go on, I just want to thank you for um, sharing your story and illuminating for us some of the issues. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Caitlin Carmen, and I'm a third year PhD student in classics. $38,500 is the living wage in Ann Arbor. 
graduate students would need a 60% raise to reach this minimum. And that's what we've proposed at the bargaining table in our ongoing negotiations with the university. In response to GEO's proposal, academic HR first countered with a 2% per year increase. And then this past Friday, a 3%, then 2.5%, then 2% increase, and even less for Dearborn and Flint. AHR has argued that their offer is in line with peer institutions. This is false. While the University of Michigan is in the top third of its peers in terms of its endowment, it's in the bottom 20% in terms of graduate pay and would fall even further behind under HR's proposal. UM cannot expect to attract the best graduate students while paying us so much less than its competitors. To justify their stance, AHR has said that we are part-time employees. This too is false. When not doing GSI and GSSA work, we are researchers, mentors, colleagues, and committee members. We contribute to a diverse intellectual community at UM, and we are essential in maintaining the university's reputation. Without a living wage, we cannot continue to do this work. An, a an AHR has admitted that they have made no effort to analyze how grad workers would live on their proposed salary, while also claiming that our raise ask is infeasible. What is infeasible is asking graduate workers to live on $24,000 per year. We are skipping meals, selling our plasma and eggs to make ends meet. This is unsustainable. Unlike AHR, we've done our homework and we know the university is in excellent financial shape. With a $17.3 billion endowment and nearly half a billion dollars per year in operating cash flows. AHR is refusing to take us and our problems seriously. We cannot live on our current wage and the unreasonable raises they've proposed do not address our situation. We need a counter that accurately addresses our needs and reflects the essential role we fill at the University of Michigan. Juan Gonzalez, Bedsville Good afternoon. My name is Juan, and I am currently a fourth year undergraduate at the University of Michigan studying music and history. I'm here today as a member of the Young Democratic Socialists of America, standing in firm solidarity with the ongoing contract campaign of the Graduate Employees Organization, or GEO. More specifically, though, I'm here to talk about their very reasonable and baseline demands pertaining to the university stance on COVID-19. Despite working as fully fledged instructors at this institution, GSIs currently have practically no agency when it comes to masking policies and teaching modalities. Just think about that for a second. They can't enforce mandatory masking, nor can they pivot to an online format if need be. Now, say you're a GSI with a disability, or you're a student with an immunodeficiency disorder, or you're a friend or a loved one of a GSI or student with multiple comorbidities. What options do you have? What recourse is there? What assistance has the university provided to help guide you? The answer is none. To deny GEO's request for agency regarding COVID-19 policies, is to deny disabled and immunocompromised GSIs and students the right to exist and thrive at this university. U of M community members with disabilities cannot continue to be ignored and cast aside, especially not if the university is ever going to truly practice what it preaches and provide a diverse, equitable, and inclusive experience to all of its students, fac faculty, and staff. GEO realizes this, and as the administration that runs this institution, the very least you could do is realize it too. Thank you. Claudio Aguayo. Good evening. My name is Claudio Aguayo. I came to the <laughs> University of Michigan in 2017 when buy egg, buying eggs was cheaper. Everything has been extremely difficult recently. This is my personal experience as a GSI in one of the richest universities in the world. My wife has a mental condition and cannot use CAPS services for not being a student. Consequently, I pay out-of-pocket therapies beside the copays and prescriptions and psychiatrists every month. I have two kids and the dental plan does, doesn't cover them appropriately. I still owe hundreds of dollars to the University of Michigan District. University of Michigan housing rises its prices every year, yes, even during the pandemic, and consequently, I have lived with my bank account on negative balance every month for years in Michigan, having to ask money for my family, my academic department, and other irregular sources. Since my problem is chronic and not exceptional, I'm obviously not eligible for the emergency funds. 
I think the most painful part of my situation is seeing the structural indolence of the University of Michigan. Every semester I deal with the terror of not being able to enroll in my courses because by living in the housing, I'm almost always behind my rent payment, with main, with mean, which means that I have a hold every semester on my financial account. I'm deeply grateful to every person in the institution that helped me, but the situation of international students with family here is structurally critical. We can only work 20 hours, our spouses are not allowed to work, and because of that, we're not eligible for a number of benefits. For example, we cannot apply for the childcare subsidy. We pay higher taxes and receive no refunds because of some recent laws passed by the reactionary elite of this country. Yes, we international students with family are at the pit of poverty in an arbor. But we believe that there are solutions, rising the salaries for GSIs accordingly with the dramatic inflation, stop putting holes on the accounts of students who fall behind the rent, create a more equitable and human housing, and a specific aid system for students with family. Good wishes and prayers are not longer enough in this country and this university. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Riza Amini. Hi. Uh, my name is Reza Amini, an associate professor of public health from College of Health Sciences, uh, Flint campus. In our college, faculty have actively revised curricula across different programs to make them more up to date and more accessible for students and generated ideas to add new programs since last year. However, we needed more help gathering external data regarding market changes and community needs. With the support of the Huron Group, the transformation planning process allows us to access those data and incorporate them in reviewing and revising current programs and developing new programs at the undergrad and grad levels. Since August, we have reviewed the proposals for the new programs with high market demands and to address workforce shortages in local hospital at Michigan Medicine and across the state and revised programs during the monthly meeting, faculty meeting. As a result of this collaboration, faculty in the College of Health Sciences have been actively engaged in the transformation process for our unit. We are excited to support the proposal put forward <coughs> by our college. Many faculty on campus strongly support this transformation process, which offers opportunities for students to gain education in high demand fields and to help address the critical workforce needs uh, of our state and beyond. I want to thank the regents and President Ono for this opportunity that allows Yovan Flint to continue its essential role in Tennessee County, Michigan, nationally and internationally. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Brown? Yes, I'd just like, on behalf of all of the Board of Regents, like to thank everyone that spoke today. Um, I say it every time, but I've been on that side of the, of the bar and, and on that side of the mic, and I know how hard it can be and how important each of your issues are that you spoke about today, and we listened to every one of them. So thank you. I'd also like to join Regent Brown in thanking all of you for your comments. I'd like to call particular attention to the three individuals who spoke about affordable housing. Uh, your comments uh, have been noted. And I'd like to say that uh, during the campus planning process, one of the things that we are considering is affordable housing on the North Campus. So thank you very much for the time that you've taken in, in delivering those uh, recommendations. And uh, we look forward to receiving uh, your submission, as you said, that you would be providing uh, by email. So thank you so much for the work you put into that. And thanks to everyone who commented during public comments. With that, today's Regents meeting is adjourned. Thank you.